We talked about a few minutes ago how at the Great Depression, a lot of people were taking their money out of the banks and hiding it. And that is because they did not trust the banks. If you've ever watched It's a Wonderful Life, you know what a run on the bank looks like. Everyone gets scared that their bank will go out of business. And so they try to get every penny out of their bank accounts. The problem is when you invest your money in a bank, it's not just sitting around in the vault somewhere. It goes into projects designed to make money. And one of those biggest projects is uh, loans for houses, for mortgages. Uh, and, and that's what George Bailey says in It's a Wonderful Life. Hey, I don't have all your money. All your money is in Mr. Smith's house and in Mr. So-and-so's car and, and your money's out there. We only have so much money. Maybe only 5% of our total money is in the bank at any one time. And all those people insist on getting the money. Well, what happens if your bank goes bankrupt? Well, that's really nice if you have a mortgage. Imagine you just bought a house for $200,000 and then the bank goes bankrupt. Who do you pay back? Now, that's a really good question. Now, what would usually happen is another bank buys your mortgage from the dying bank. Uh, so now you just have to pay someone else. Uh, that kind of happened to my mortgage. Uh, my original bank uh, didn't die, but they sold my mortgage to someone else. And I just got a letter in the mail saying, um, well, now you have to pay us instead of them. Same amount of money per month and everything. Same terms. They're not allowed to change it. But they bought the mortgage from them. But if the bank goes bankrupt and no one bought their mortgage, well, you might not have to pay anyone that $200,000 and you might be going, yeah, nice. Well, what happens to the person who had deposited $200,000 in the bank? They don't get a penny of that money back. Ooh. You know, there is something that Bernie Sanders and a lot of other people are saying right now, and that is there are too many college kids who are in debt. And wouldn't it be really nice if we just forgave their debt? just erased it completely. I go, yeah, that would be wonderful for the college students. College is really expensive and it's a lot more expensive than it used to be. And I do agree that something needs to be done. But if you just ignore their debts, say, oh, you don't have to pay them back. Well, that's great for the college kids. What about the people who had invested money in the bank who don't get their money back? You see, forgiving debt doesn't just make the debt go away. The money has to come from somewhere. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that that's anyone, you or me. Well, during the Great Dep Depression, hundreds of banks did go bankrupt and many people lost every penny that they had in their bank account. And so the government decided to try to fix that and say, what can we do so that this never happens again? And they forced every bank in America to get insurance. Uh, just like you have car insurance, homeowners insurance, flood insurance, health insurance, banks have bank insurance. What there is only one insurance company for banks that the federal government runs. It's called FDIC or Federal Deposit Insurance Company. Every bank must buy this insurance. And uh, it insures everyone's bank account up to $250,000. That is, if your bank goes bankrupt, you get a check in the mail from the insurance company for every penny that you lost, provided that you have less than $250,000. And if you're a millionaire, you could buy your own insurance for more money than that, uh, if you want to. Now, you might think this is the win for everyone. Now, I don't have to be scared of my bank going bankrupt. But remember, insurance does cost money. And that is why back in the day, you might have been able to get a 4% interest uh, on your bank account. And now you're getting a tenth of a percent interest. You have to pay insurance. Speaking of insurance, insurance is a type of investment. I'm spending money now and getting no benefit now, but I'm hoping that I will get a benefit in the future. Well, I don't know that I would ever hope to use my insurance, but I'm providing a safeguard for the future. There are lots of different types of insurance. In fact, you can buy insurance on anything that could possibly go wrong. There's health insurance that, and you can buy lots of different types of health insurance covering different maladies. Uh, there is car insurance. If you don't buy car insurance, guys, well, first of all, it's illegal and you can go to jail and lose your license and lose your car. But if you get in a crash, you can... Oh, upwards of $100,000 easily. If you get in a bad crash, you can owe upwards of a million dollars. Imagine two or three or four cars are totaled. That's a lot of money right there. Now imagine there's five or six people that need to go to the hospital, maybe a surgery, maybe a week or two in the hospital. That is a lot of money and, and it adds up very, very fast. Get car insurance. It's the law and you'll be in big trouble if you don't. Anyway, there's health insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance in case you know your home burns down or there's a flood or um, 
vandal throws a rock through your window, anything like that. There's insurance for the banks, as we've seen. Uh, there is unemployment insurance that goes through the government. Uh, that is a social welfare pro uh, program uh, called um, workers' comp, workers' compensation. If something goes bad on the job, you know, you get injured uh, or, or you just lose your job for any reason. Well, not for any reason, actually. Um, if you just lose your job, you can get that money. Typically, if you're fired, you're not allowed to get unemployment. <laughs> if you've done something wrong, the government won't pay you for that. And if you quit, you usually can't get money for that either. Um, but if you're laid off, you can. Anyway, insurance is spending money now uh, to hopefully get money later. A lot of younger people and, and people who don't have a lot of money try to skip out on whatever insurance that, that they can, thinking it'll save them a little bit of money. And it might save you some money in the short term, but in the long term, that's a really bad idea. Insurance is a very good investment because things do go wrong. Things will go wrong. Insurance terms can be difficult to understand, but the basic idea is very easy to understand. First, you give the company a set amount of money per month. Second, if you have a problem, they pay you a lot more money than you ever paid in. For example, if you get car insurance, you might have to pay three or $400 every six months. That's not so bad. Uh, but if you get in a car crash, they might give you 50 grand. Uh, well, that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, so the, the amount of money that you pay every month is called the premium. Uh, that can vary based on what kind of insurance it is. Uh, some health insurance or some life insurance uh, protecting you from death. Uh, that can be 10 bucks a month, not bad at all. Or it could go up to a couple hundred bucks a month or even more if you're rather old or really sick, uh, then they, they know that they'll have to pay that out. And the way an insurance company works is that if, if you have 100 people who give uh, $1 each, let's say, well, that's 100 bucks. Well, what if one person needs $90? Well, then you give them the $90 and there's $10 left over. And that goes to paying the insurance people and, and getting themselves a profit. Of course, all these people are, are working on a profit. This reminds me of uh, Mr. Incredible. He worked at an insurance company, right? And he was a nice guy. So he kept on paying people what the insurance company owed him. And the mean little boss said, hey, the more you give people money, the less money there is for our stockholders, the less money there is for us, and we're all going to be out of a job. Of course, that's not fair. A lot of people try to defraud insurance. Some people um, try to fake uh, accidents or injuries in order to claim insurance money. There's actually a town in Florida where people keep on uh, hurting themselves on purpose to get insurance money. Uh, and there's a bunch of people with only one foot there. No, I, I don't... I don't think it's worth it. Um, there are some people who will burn down their own business for the insurance money. Um, like George Bailey said, and it's a wonderful life. I'm worth more dead than alive. If I die, my family gets $30,000 or something. But if I live, my uh, my company's out of business and I got no money. Um, that's really sad. But a lot of people do that with their businesses. Well, my business isn't making any money, but if I burn it down, I can get a nice cash settlement. And do I have to use that to rebuild the business? No. I could build a completely different type of business or just go on a cruise, uh, not a cruise, with COVID. <laughs> All right, so the premium is the money you give every month. Uh, the settlement is usually what they call uh, the amount of money they give you when there is a problem. Now, it does get a lot more complicated than that really, really quickly, depending on the type of insurance. A copay is something where the insurance will not pay everything uh, that, that is required. And so you have to pay with that co-payment. Uh, you often see a copay in medical and dental insurance uh, where they'll say, okay, the doctor's charging you 500 bucks. The insurance will pay 400 bucks. There's a $100 copay. So not only are you paying them every month, but you also have to pay the doctor every time you visit them. That's a copay. Um, sometimes there's something called a deductible where the insurance says you pay for the first X amount and then we'll pay for everything else. Uh, so for my car insurance, I think I have a thousand dollar deductible. That is, if I get in a car crash, I pay, if, if it's my fault, I pay the first thousand dollars and then the insurance will take care of everything else. And there's usually an upper limit as well. Uh, my insurance won't pay out a million bucks, but they have you know, a certain amount of money and I have to pay the first thousand and then anything on top of that. Well, what if I get in a really mild car crash? What if I just um, ding someone's uh, bumper? and they want to pay to have that fixed. That might be a couple hundred bucks. 
well, I have to pay all of it because that doesn't meet the thousand dollar deductible. Uh, okay. Sometimes it gets really complicated. Health insurance is often crazy complicated. So there's a deductible and I have to pay the first X amount. Uh, and then there's the copay. And then uh, the, they will only pay a copay up to so much a year. And it, it just gets really, really complicated. Um, a lot of people want to fix the insurance companies by trying to uh, make, make everything more transparent. Um, but these complications are meant to help people only pay for what they use. And that's what copays do. If you don't use the doctor very often, you're not paying the copay. Uh, so to fix that, you could give everyone a higher deductible or a higher monthly um, bill, and, and that will pay the same amount of money. Uh, but people might be paying more, even though they're not using that service as much. The government wants you to save your money for retirement because the government wants you to retire. Why would the government want you out of the workforce? It's pretty easy. So someone else can get a job. As medical attention and care has gotten better and better, we're seeing older and older people not retiring uh, like they used to because they're still healthy enough to stay in the workforce for a longer time. And that's a problem for the young guys who are trying to get into the workforce. So the government encourages people to uh, to save money for the future. And one way they do that is by reducing taxes. You can get something called a 401k, uh, which is a, a type of savings plan that you're really not supposed to take the money out of until you retire. Uh, if you put money in your retirement account, then it's usually not taxed at all. Uh, sometimes there, there's different kinds of accounts. Uh, usually it's not taxed at all when you put it in and it's only taxed when you take it out. If you take it out early, it's usually taxed uh, above and beyond what it normally would be. Uh, but if you take it out later in life, um, typically um, uh, several of these are not taxed at all or taxed at a much uh, reduced rate. Uh, one way that companies try to help their uh, employees work uh, for the future, work for retirement, is that they will also have some kind of pension plan. Pension just means uh, basically like a retirement account where the government uh, or the business will pay you after you're done working. And so they put aside part of your money right now to save up for the future. And it's not just in a bank account getting a tenth of percent interest. They'll put it in some kind of stocks and bonds and, and things like that to get hopefully several percent interest. Um, usually that is called a defined contribution plan uh, where the employer defines how much they're giving. Sometimes they'll do matching up to a certain amount of money. So if you put in a hundred bucks a month, they'll also put in a hundred bucks a month as well. A lot of companies don't do pension plans anymore. It's very, very rare. A type of investment that has been around for millennia and will continue to be a very, uh, very clever investment is in property, land, and in buildings. Land will always be valuable. It always has been, it always will be. Land ownership was one of the biggest draws of bringing people to America in the first place. In Europe, in the feudal times, middle ages, only the noblemen were allowed to own land and they rented it out to everyone else. Rents is not a good idea. If you can buy, you should. See, at the end of the year, you've paid 12 months rent. What do you have to show for it? Absolutely nothing. At the end of a year, if you have a mortgage, after 12 months of paying off your mortgage, you own a larger part of that house. You can go ahead and sell it. Even buying just empty real estate can be a really good investment plan. Some of the founding fathers were real estate speculators. Ethan Allen, famous in Vermont, uh, he's the, the Green Mountain Boy leader. Ethan Allen and his brothers uh, Ira and Ezra, they bought up millions of acres of land in Vermont. They called it the Onion River Company, if I remember correctly. Onion River uh, is a big river out there. We call it Winooski now. Uh, some. Uh, Indian term for that. Well, you buy a million acres now and then divide it up into 50, 100 acre lots and sell it off to farmers, you can make a, a good amount of money that way. Now, I will caution you, no house, no money, no real estate is a sure deal. No investment is a sure deal. The price of that real estate could go up or it could possibly go down. That is why buying a lot of land and selling it is called a speculation. You're guessing, you're hoping that the price will go up, but it might not. 
there was a big land bust in Florida way back in the day. Uh, Florida was advertised as this beautiful tropical paradise. People were buying up tons and tons of land. And then in quick succession, there were like three or four nasty hurricanes that just came and wiped out everybody's houses, uh, just destroyed whole uh, villages and towns. And all of a sudden people didn't want to move to Florida anymore. And whoever bought a ton of land at really high prices, well, that land wasn't a good investment. Also, land does cost money to own. If you rent a house and the dishwasher breaks, the owner of the house has to fix it or buy you a new one. If the roof leaks, the owner of the house has to fix it. But if you own the house, you have to spend all the money on that. Uh, and then what about property taxes? Property taxes can be really stinking high. And then there's other maintenance and, and other fees associated with owning land. So if you have a lot of land and you're not making money off of it right now, it can cost you a lot of money. And hopefully you'll make that money in the future, but maybe not. When I was 12, my parents moved from a small village to absolutely middle of nowhere. And they tried renting out our house. And if I remember correctly, it was about a year before they found any renters. And that was really tough financially to be paying the mortgage on two houses uh, to be paying the property tax on two houses and, and all the maintenance and all the upkeep on two houses with only one income. And finally, we got some renters and rental properties can be very lucrative. But again, what happens if you don't get renters? Well, then you have to spend a lot of money and you're not making any money. So by no means a sure deal, but can be very lucrative. Now we're getting to a section that I've actually dabbled in recently, stocks. Stocks. Uh, bonds and mutual funds. I'm sure you know what a stock is. It is a percentage of a company. This is one of the biggest ways that companies nowadays make money is by selling parts of their company. And they don't sell 10 shares. They don't sell 100 shares. They sell 100,000 shares or a million shares. So that is a very small percentage of their company. Uh, but they offer up shares of their company uh, online or in public in Wall Street and people buy it and they take that money to invest in their company. Uh, the price of shares will go up and down based on, again, supply and demand. If I buy a share for five bucks, I'm gonna try to sell it for $5.10. But if no one wants to buy it for $5.10, I'll ask if anyone wants it for 505. No? Well, maybe I'll just sell it for five bucks and break even. No, people still don't want it? Okay, 495. And then, you know, I just try to haggle the price and see who wants to buy my shares. There are two reasons for buying sh uh, shares of stock. First reason is hoping that the price will go up and I could sell it later. If I buy a, a share for $5 now and later the price is $10, I sell it. I just you know, made 100% profit. That's pretty cool. Imagine if you had bought Apple stock back in the day. You bought 100 shares of Apple for a couple bucks each and now they're up to several hundred dollars. <laughs> That's really nice. There's another thing that shares do. Uh, if the price of the shares is going too high, they will cut the shares in half uh, and, and they'll give everyone who has one share, they'll give them one extra share and then they'll cut the price in half as well. That's pretty cool. So if I bought 10 shares for five bucks and it goes up to $10, I might do a, a share split. And now I have, how much did I say? Did I say I bought 10 shares? I forget. Now I have 20 shares at five bucks instead of 10 shares at five bucks. Uh, that's pretty cool. And of course, if you hold on to that, stock long term, what if it splits again? Well, now I have 40 shares, but it splits again, now I have 80 shares. And the second reason that uh, gives people an incentive for buying stocks is the dividends. Most companies pay dividends, but they don't always. Uh, they don't have to. A dividend is where they give every share of stock a little bit of money. Um, sometimes it's five cents, sometimes it's 10 cents. So again, if I have 10 shares and there's a 10 cent min, um, dividend, I just got $1. 10 dividends of 10 cents each. Uh, usually these dividends are paid quarterly and usually it's what the company does with whatever money it has left over. It, it pays its shareholders and that's usually paying themselves because the people making the decisions for these companies are the board of directors who are usually the majority uh, shareholders. So when the board of directors says, let's give a 10 cent dividend to everyone, they might've just voted themselves a million bucks each or more uh, and they can do that. Well, if you own the, the stock, that means that you own a percentage of the company. That means that you have the right to help decide how that company works and you vote. Each share is one vote. Uh, I had the opportunity to vote on Ford uh, and to vote on Johnson & Johnson. Uh, they're doing well. Um, they're, they're making some supplies for coronavirus. 
Um, so I got to vote on many different things. And of course, my few dollars worth of stock really doesn't make anything. But if you invested a $5 million in Ford, then your vote really does have a lot of clout. So this idea of shareholders and stocks this is a fairly new idea, only about 400 years old. In the 1600s, uh, Plymouth Plantation, that was one of the first uh, companies to be made um, for the purpose of exploring the new world. And there were people who had bought shares. So there were shareholders uh, in the Virginia Company and the Plymouth Company. Those were the two biggest uh, companies in England at the time. Uh, a corporation is different than the people who are running it. They are their own legal entity. And in America, a corporation is pretty much defined the same as a person. So a corporation has a lot of the same rights as a person, including freedom of speech. And the government has said that spending your money is a way of speech. So corporations get to spend their money on whatever they feel like spending their money. Uh, very, very interesting there. A lot of the times they decide to spend their money on uh, campaign ads for various politicians, which isn't bribery at all. Uh, but corporations are different than people. That, they're different than the people who own them. And so they have what's called limited liability. In fact, a lot of companies are called LLCs, limited liability companies. If I start a company and I sell shares, but I keep 51% of the shares for myself, uh, then I, I'm the owner of the company, the majority owner. Uh, but if the company does really bad and owes someone 5 million bucks, I don't owe that person 5 million bucks. The company does. So if I'm rich and the company has no money at all, I do not spend my own money to pay the company's debt. Nope, I'm not responsible for the company. Even if it was me that made really bad decisions and wasted all the company's money, I am not responsible for that. The worst thing that can happen to me is that my company goes bankrupt and it's gone. Uh, I am not responsible to pay my company's debt. Limited liability. You might think, well, that's that stinks for the people who invest in your company, but it does help uh, people to create new companies. It reduces the risk for the investors, uh, for the entrepreneurs rather, and, and it just helps uh, make more business. Stocks are typically very volatile. Volatile means that the price changes constantly. Uh, compared to many other goods and services, uh, they're one of the most volatile things. For instance, the price of bread might go up and down a little bit, but it'll stay pretty much the same. But the price of a piece of stock can, can differ wildly. For example, uh, when I got into stocks uh, right before the coronavirus thing, I did invest a little bit in Ford at over $7 a share, and today it dipped under $5 a share. Now, thankfully, the vast majority of my investment was at just over $5, so I'm pretty good right now. I'm just going to wait till it goes uh, back up a little bit, and I'll, I'll be in the profit again. Um, but there were some other shares that I saw. Uh, the worst one was a, a shipping company. Its shares used to be 20 bucks a share. Now they're like three cents a share. Absolutely volatile. And then there's success stories as well, like Apple that used to be just uh, pennies and now um, has split again and again and again and again. Uh, the equivalent of thousands of dollars a share. I think Amazon is, is up in the thousands. There, there's some shares that are incredibly expensive, uh, very volatile, and they change not only day to day, they change second to second. Uh, you can look at what's called a stock ticker, and it'll show you the different stocks, and it'll go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Uh, and that is because the price of the stock is pretty much based on uh, what you think everyone else thinks. It's herd instinct. People buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell so quickly. Um, that they're haggling the prices so quickly, very, very volatile. To make a, a type of investment similar to a stock, much less volatile, you have something called a bond. Uh, if, if maybe for the phrase, my word is my bond, a bond means a promise. Uh, a bond in investment circles today just means basically a check with a, a cash buy date. Uh, it says, I will pay you X amount of money on this date, not before. It is a more long-term investment. Uh, and typically, when that bond matures, it will give you a really nice return on investment. Uh, the difference between that and like a savings account is that bonds are issued by companies. So for instance, if Apple needs a lot of money to build a new iPhone factory, they might sell $5 million worth of bonds and everyone buys them in $500 or $1,000 um, uh, increments. And they might have a six-month or year or two-year uh, time period on them might give you two or three percent interest. 
Uh, maybe you've seen uh, or or seen um, movies or or books about World War II, World War One. One way that the government raised money is by selling government bonds, sometimes called war bonds or liberty bonds. We need to buy a lot of bullets and tanks and airplanes and bandages uh, for the soldiers. So why don't you invest in the American government, and we promise we'll pay you back in the future. Well, just like stocks, you know, there is no sure thing. What if what if Apple makes this new factory and it loses money, doesn't make any money, no one wants to buy a new iPhone? Well, then they can't pay their bond and Apple goes bankrupt. Uh-oh. Uh, thankfully, the U.S. government has to pay its debts. It is in the Constitution. You must pay your debts. You may not go bankrupt. Um, by the way, I think it was Argentina just went bankrupt for the seventh time, <laughs> refusing to pay their debts. That's not good. America has to pay their debts. And bonds are one way that the government does, uh, does give out its debt. How is the government gonna pay this $2 trillion coronavirus thing? They don't have $2 trillion lying around. A lot of that does come in bonds. They say, hey, who wants to buy government bonds? Gets the government a lot of money now, and they don't have to pay it until later. Well, what if I don't have $2 trillion in six months or a year or two years? Well, one thing you can do is shuffle around bonds. You can sell, a, a second bond to someone else to pay off the first guy's bond. Uh, and that is what the government has done for many, many, many years. Uh, you might have seen, you know, we've been in debt for decades. We've hardly ever been out of debt, but it's not the same debt. We keep on revolving debt, revolving debt. Uh, we borrow from bank A to pay bank B and then from bank C to pay bank A and then bank B again to pay bank C. And, and it revolves to that. And as long as we're paying the interest, um, the people are, are pretty happy. Um, there's no one who can say, well, the government hasn't paid me in 52 years. No, no, they pay their bonds. Bonds are given a letter scale based on how likely they are to be uh, paid in full and how likely they are to go bankrupt. Uh, they go from AAA down to C or D. So they have like A, 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 A. And if you have AAA bonds, that means this is a really good company and they will absolutely pay their bonds. You get a bond for Apple or Microsoft or Amazon, you know they're going to pay their bonds. Even the U.S. government, they're going to pay their bonds. But if it's something that's, you know, a mom and pop business or a business that's doing really poorly, um, they might have a B or C rating saying they might not pay their bonds. If the company is run by someone who's gone bankrupt before, they're not going to have good bonds. I would imagine Kmart. Have you seen the Kmart recently? Don't buy Kmart stock or Kmart bonds or JCPenney. Uh, that will not be a good investment. What if you can't afford to buy a bunch of stock right now, or you don't know which stock to buy? Well, you can invest in a mutual fund. Mutual means together with other people. There will be investors, smart money people, who will take investments from hundreds of different people and put all the money together in one big fund. And if you collect a little bit of money from hundreds of people, you might get thousands or millions of dollars, and then you invest in a little bit of everything. You buy some Ford, you buy some Verizon, you buy some Amazon, you buy some Apple, you buy some government bonds, you know, you buy stocks of all kinds, maybe even buy up some real estate, and, and you just buy all sorts of different investments, a little bit of everything. And that is to try to minimize your risk. You know some of these will probably go down and lose money, and the others will go up and make you money, and hopefully you'll make more money than you lose. I remember this reduces risk, but what, uh, what always comes with a reduced risk? Reduced reward as well. Um, a lot of retirement funds are in mutual funds. Uh, you want to diversify your money, diversify your portfolio by buying in a whole lot of different things. And even diversify different types of things. You shouldn't just buy Ford and Chrysler and Toyota and Chevy. Well, what happens when you just buy car company stock and then everyone stays at home because of the coronavirus? <laughs> All the car company stock goes down because uh, no one's driving their cars or buying new cars anymore. No, so buy some car company stock, buy some phone company, uh, buy some manufacturing, buy some farming equipment stock, buy, buy a little bit of everything uh, so you know you're going to make a little bit of money. By the way, someone did a real study and they tried to see if these money manager experts were really good at picking the best stocks that will, that will go up the majority of the time. And they compared three different money market accounts and mutual fund accounts. They compared them to uh, the stock picks of monkeys. So what they did is they wrote out the names of all these different companies. They stuck them up on a dartboard and they had the monkeys throw darts and they, they followed the, the monkey picks versus the stock picks. And the monkeys did like half a percent better. So uh, no one really knows which stocks are going to go up and down. It's totally a gamble. 
if you invest in a mutual account, you will probably make at least a little bit of money. And some people who are clever and, and take a good look at the market and, and can figure out what's going on, some people make an awful lot of money off of investing stocks. Uh, I've been seeing an ad by a guy who invested $12,000 just five years ago, and he's a millionaire now. So that's a, a wonderful return on investment. Um, but then why don't more people do it? Well, one reason is liquidity of funds. Liquidity uh, of your money refers to how much you're able to move it around. If you spend a million dollars in in stocks and then an emergency happens and I need that money right now, can I get that money right now? Not so much. Uh, you have to sell off your stocks. And what if the stocks had just barely gone down? Well, you you would usually wait for it to go back up again to sell it. But if I need that money right now, I might have to sell those stocks at a loss. Uh, bonds are even worse. Uh, if I take my money out of a bond, I'm not getting any interest and I'm probably going to get a big fine uh, as well. Uh, so what if I really need that money right now? I need some liquid assets uh, and then I need some that are going to make more money. Uh, going back to real estate, having a rental uh, house can make you a lot of money. But what if you have an emergency and I need money right now? So you put your house up on the market, you sell your house. Um, and at the best, it could take you two or three months to sell your house. And there's some people who've been trying to sell their house for five or six years and still can't find a buyer. So housing is not a great investment in if you're afraid that you might have an emergency. Uh, you want some funds to be liquid as well. When you invest your money, there's three, things, three key things to think about, and that is time, rate of return, and amount invested. Number one, how much time is this taking? Uh, to invest. If, you know, if you're young and you have college bills to pay, you might not want to invest in a 10-year program. That's way too long-term for you. If you're 40 or 50 and, and you have all your bills taken care of and you have a decent job, well, then a 10-year investment might be a much better idea for you. Um, rate of return. How much money am I going to make on this investment? Remember, the higher the rate of return, the, the bigger chances there are of, of losing everything. Higher reward does mean higher risk typically. And then lastly, amount invested. How much do I have to invest right now? Should I invest my bottom dollar? If you absolutely are sure that it's going to be a sure thing, go ahead and invest your bottom dollar. Um, but if you have bills to pay and you have debts hanging over your head, you can't. You need some money. Well, we've talked today about how the government really wants you to save for the future. And we've talked about how the government today is spending $2 trillion to try to help the coronavirus crisis. Well, last time the government spent an awful lot of money on a crisis was the Great Depression. Uh, they, the government spent hundreds of billions of dollars, which was a lot of money at the time. And one thing that they looked at was that there were a lot of elderly people uh, who needed help and, and needed some money. So a doctor actually wrote to FDR and he said, wouldn't it be a great idea to just give all elderly people a, ca a check in the mail just for being old? Um, just no reason, here's some cash. And thus the social security was born. Uh, social security is a form of forced investment. The government takes your money out of every single paycheck as, as a form of taxes, puts it away, and then uses it to pay old people. It is a type of socialism. America is not 100% uh, capitalist. Uh, they do force you to invest your money. Now, it could be a good investment. Uh, if you don't make a lot of money um, in your lifetime, you could get back and a lot more money uh, in your elderly years. Uh, on the other hand, if you are very rich and make a lot of money, uh, you are paying a lot more in taxes than you're getting back. Not saying it's a good plan or a bad plan. Saving for the future is a, a really good idea. Not sure that it's the government's job to force you to save for the future. And I'm not sure that they are doing a really good job at uh, keeping up with Social Security. Usually when the Social Security program is in the news, it's because it's doing poorly and they don't have enough money and they're not investing it very well. And I don't personally like it. I do see the need for uh, many elderly people have no other form of income. So I'm not saying we abolish it altogether today. That would be disastrous. Uh, I kind of wish it hadn't happened in the first place. That being said, I got money for the coronavirus, and I'm not complaining about that. And when I get old, I'm going to be relying on Social Security myself, and I won't complain about it. Um, I, I might complain when the, the bill comes due for the coronavirus check and all my taxes are raised later. We'll see. Guys, I hope if you take nothing else away that you will be thinking about the future and thinking about how to save your money. I know none of you are rich. 
you have bills to pay. Uh, many of you are going to go to college very soon, and that is going to be the number one thing that you have to pay for. When you get out of college or out of the military or, or whatever, you're probably going to have to either rent or buy a house, and uh, money will probably be tight for you for a little while. But be thinking about the future. How can I save money for the future? Almost everyone can save a little bit of money. Not everyone can. Sometimes your bills are higher than your income. That just happens. Uh, many people are, and, and I think it's it's kind of arrogant for uh, someone to say, well, everyone can save money. That's just not true. Sometimes people have really high bills and really low paychecks. Anyway, do be thinking about how you spend your money. Maybe you can cut back and, and save a little bit for the future. Even if you just save 10 bucks a, a month, that's something, that is a start. Do not spend all your money as soon as you make it, if at all possible. Be thinking about the future, and future you will thank you.